Hello everyone, welcome to Study IQ. And in this video, I will bring to you the PIB analysis from 9th of July 2017. Please note that this series will be continued forever till I can. And uh, if there is a delay sometimes because of my other commitment, then do not feel disheartened. I will cover each and every single day. Don't worry about it. If you want to prepare for UPSC, then the best way to prepare is by our pen drive course. Why I'm saying best is because you can prepare from the comfort of your home and you will get the same quality that is available in the Delhi Coaching Institutes and some of the best faculty have designed and prepared this course. So you need to go to our website studyiq.com to avail this course. Please also note that uh, we have started UPSC mains 2017 test series. There will be 15 essay tests that will be there and this detail also you can find on our website studyiq.com. So I always start my video with the one personality and I tell you guys to identify that personality. So who is she? And she is very popular. And she, is, uh, she has suddenly become very important, especially in US. That's your clue. Identify who is she. So let's begin. So today I will focus on G20 summit. I will also focus on the petrol prices in India, how they are regulated and uh, why we don't get the benefit of decrease in global oil prices. And so I'll cover various things. Today I don't have an essay, but this video is very, very important. Now, let's talk about G20 summit. So G20 summit was in Hamburg in Germany. It has recently been concluded and Prime Minister Narendra Modi met three important Prime Ministers. First, he met uh, Prime Minister Moon Jae-in of Republic of Korea, also called South Korea. Please note that, uh, you know, what is the meaning of meeting on the sidelines? Meeting on the sidelines means that whenever there is an important summit or important uh, organizational summit or any event, then... You know, on the sidelines means the, he will attend the G20 summit, all right. But whatever time extra he gets, he can meet, always meet the head of states or important people from other countries. That is called meeting on the sidelines. So on the sidelines of G20, Prime Minister Modi met Moon Jae-in. And do you remember the ex-president of Republic of Korea, Park Gun hye So Park Gun hye she was uh, indicted for corruption. She was impeached by the parliament of South Korea. And then elections took place and Moon Jae-in was uh, declared the winner. So we want to cooperate with South Korea in trade, commerce and uh, already a lot of South Korean companies like Hyundai, LG, Samsung and many others, they are operating in the country. Prime Minister Modi also met Italian Prime Minister Paolo Gentiloni uh, on the sidelines of the summit. Now please note that Paolo Gentiloni, uh, we again want to, uh, you know, have a cooperation in the food sector with Italy. And Prime Minister Modi invited Italy's participation in the World Food India. What is World Food India? It is the food processing exhibition that will be conducted by the Ministry for Food Processing. And it will, be, uh, it will take place in India in November uh, in 2017. And why Italy is important with respect to food cooperation is because the World Food Program, its headquarter is in Rome, which is the capital of Italy. Also, Food and Agriculture Organization, its headquarter is also in Rome, which is in Italy. Prime Minister Modi also met uh, the Prime Minister of Norway, H-E-M-S-R-M-S -S Erna uh, Solberg. And uh, that is his full name, M.S. Erna Solberg. And again, we want to strengthen economic relations with Scandinavian country of Norway. And uh, basically, uh, Narendra Modi invited Norwegian Prime Minister uh, and he to the, you know, our that food processing event, world food event that we have in India. And also, uh, you know, there was talk about Norwegian pension funds. Norwegian pension funds, Narendra Modi invited the participation of Norwegian pension funds in the National Investment and Infrastructure Fund. And Prime Minister of Norway in return, he invited Narendra Modi uh, to participate in the Oceans Conference, which will take place on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly. And in a gesture symbolizing cooperation for attainment of sustainable development goals. So Prime Minister Modi and Solberg, they together said that we will cooperate to achieve sustainable development goals, which we are uh, which is a part of Agenda 2030. We have to achieve these in these 17 Sustainable Development Goals in 15 years. And also, Prime Minister of uh, Norway, Mr. Solberg, gifted Prime Minister Modi a football with Sustainable Development Goals inscribed on it. Now, let's talk about G20. Very important. If I tell you that G20 has 20 countries, is it correct or not? It's wrong. It's not correct because it consists of 19 countries and European Union and you know European Union has many countries and therefore there are more than 20 countries in G20. This can be said for G7 that G7 has 7 countries. This is absolutely correct. But G20 has more than uh, 20 countries. 
Now, uh, these are the countries which uh, the one in brown, they are part of the G20 and the one in the blue, these are these are the guest countries. So these were the guest country like the Guinea, Senegal from Africa, Spain, Vietnam and all these countries were guest countries. Now on March 2014, I'm now I'm talking about G7. So earlier they used to be called G8, but they threw out Russia. So now it is G7. And why Russia exited? Because nobody wanted Russia. Because Russia attacked Ukraine. So no. So everyone said we will not attend Russian hosted G8 Sochi summit. And therefore G8 became G7. These are very powerful uh, countries. Japan, US, Germany, Italy, UK, France and Canada. China is not a part of it. India is also not a part of G7. India is a part of G20. So India is a part of which organizations? Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India became a part in 2015. Full-time member yeah, along with Pakistan. United Nations, SARC, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. There are eight members. Then this is Mekong Ganga Cooperation. Mekong Ganga Cooperation. India is a member. G20 is mem India is a member. Indian Ocean Rim Association. India is a member. And BIMSTEC. The Bay of Bengal Initiative or Multisectoral whatever. So these are the countries in and around Bay of Bengal. India is a member of BIMSTEC also. Now before even the G20 summit began in Hamburg. See Hamburg is a place in Germany and it is all, all it is always a you know center for left. The left is very powerful in Hamburg. And you know wherever left is there they are always against capitalism. Always against the money. Because they consider money is the root source of all evils. So therefore, they are against capitalism. So one criticism of G20, especially Angela Merkel, who is the Chancellor of Germany, is that why did she arrange G20? Why did she host G20 in Hamburg? There were protests, severe protests against anti-capitalism protesters were there. There were more than 50,000. They protested. So they had to be, uh, the situation had to be assuaged with the help of police force who were finally able to stymie their, their protest. But there were a lot of protests. Somehow, they, they, they were not untowards incidences that were noted. But again, it was risky. Now, the most important news of G20 is that United States was completely isolated. So, United States President, who is called POTUS, President of the United States, Donald Trump, he said that America will withdraw from the Paris climate deal, which is also called COP21. America is among the top two biggest polluters in the world. But uh, uh, America, they withdraw from the Paris climate deal because Donald Trump said that if we are a part of the Paris climate deal, it will put pressure on our industries. And uh, because we have to reduce our carbon emission and greenhouse gas emission, our industries will not be able to function. He also said that America will need to pay a lot of amount to the developing countries like India. Uh, and uh, th this is not fair on the US. And therefore, US withdrew. Now, See, I told you there are 19 countries and European Union. So if you leave out America, let's say you count European Union as entire one, right? So apart from America, all the 19, that is 18 other members and European Union, they said that we are very happy to be a part of Paris climate deal. They called it irreversible. That is, we will not go back on our decision. And they come through their complete weight behind the landmark agreement of Paris climate deal COP21. So therefore, Washington or America they were um, they were isolated, completely isolated. In fact, Angela Merkel put very strong words. She said that it is unfortunate that America has withdrew, withdrew from the America has withdrawn from the Paris climate deal, but all the other countries have shown strong support. So this gave, gave a signal to the entire world that America is no more a leader. Next, the G20 official communique. They this time they were very strong about fighting corruption. They were completely talking about how we can uh, prevent tax evasion, corruption, terrorist financing and money laundering. So it, they said that all the G20 countries said we need to have global standards on transparency. So this is very, very important. Global standards on transparency. They focused on fighting corruption. Now let's come to one of the most important things, which is IMF quota reforms. If you remember last year in 2016, India's voting right in the IMF, earlier it was 2.3%, it increased last year to 2.6%. China's voting right in IMF was 3.8%, then it increased to 6%. So therefore, the leaders, they said that we will do, we will complete all the IMF, International Monetary Fund, quota reforms by 2019. This is important. 
and IMF head right now is Christine Lagarde. They also said that we are going digital now. So that is good. But we also need to make sure that we have necessary skills for going digital. And also with digital comes its own sets of perils. And therefore, there can be malicious use of information and communication technology. And that can greatly harm the financial stability of the G20. They also said that some countries are using market distorting subsidies. And therefore, we need to remove these market distorting subsidies. And therefore, we need to have global cooperation. Now, there were other uh, events also. For example, Modi's uh, meeting with Xi Jinping. There was no official meeting. There was just a handshake. And uh, this was uh, kind of awkward because of what is going on in the Tokalam area. Similarly, USA, Russia, they met. Donald Trump and uh, Vladimir Putin met on the sidelines of the summit and they called for mutual cooperation. So these things also took place. Now, one of the most important thing was that G20 nations said that they need to do more to prevent base erosion and profit shifting. What is BEPS? BEPS is that, let's say I'm a company in India. Okay, I will find what are the loopholes, what are the shortcomings in the law system and therefore I, I will park my profit and my earnings in a country where no tax or less tax is there to, pre to prevent paying of taxes. That is called base erosion and profit shifting. I will shift my profit somewhere else, some, in some other country. And therefore, base erosion and profit shifting needs to be done away with. And for that, they, the country said that we need to implement BEPS package, which will make sure that BEPS is removed. And uh, this thing was headed by the OECD. And this was initiated by the OECD in 2012 G20 summit. Now, OECD is Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. India is not a member of OECD, but many countries are. And it is headquartered in Paris. And also, G20 countries, again, they will meet in Argentina next year in 2018, then Japan in 2019, and then Saudi Arabia 2020. Now, what is the criticism of G20 this time? First criticism is that, uh, that there was no talk about the global productivity slowdown and stagnating real wages. So the wages of workers are going down. The industrial productivity especially is stagnating. It is declining in almost all the countries. And especially in the manufacturing sector in both the developed and the developing countries. Also, one of the most important things is that already we are having a jobless growth. Which means that the countries like India, China, Brazil, you know, we are having a jobless growth. We are not able to create jobs. And on top of that, people, the companies are using artificial intelligence, which means robots. They are using automation. So the work which, will be, which was done by laborers, which was done by the common worker in a factory, will now be done on a large scale by the artificial intelligence. And I'm talking about the digital work, so-called the white-collar jobs. That is why the sector which is most threatened is the engineers. Already they are not getting jobs. And on top of that, their work will be carried out by the artificial intelligence and automation. So therefore, that will create joblessness. In fact, World Bank has said that 69% of jobs in India are threatened. They are under danger because of artificial intelligence and automation in china 77 percent in ethiopia 85 percent so the entire world work entire world is reeling under the influence of the automation artificial intelligence when it comes to job creation now therefore there was very less talk about how we can increase the industrial productivity how we can increase the wages of worker how we can create jobs there was almost no uh, talk about that now please also note that there are no quick fix solutions for countries like brazil china india turkey which have problems of job creation stagnating industrial productivity, deflating export prices. In fact, our export prices have been declining and our agriculture exports are also declining. So therefore, we are in some trouble now. And uh, what we can do is we can do greater cooperation with the countries, the developed countries like the Europe, America, Canada. And therefore, G20 uh, was a good platform for this. But again, on joblessness, on industrial productivity, very less discussion was there. Then, greater coordination on reducing discriminatory taxation. See, this is one thing that, that does not cause a level playing field. I'll give an example of China. So I told you in my last video that the Chinese central bank, it gives loan at very cheap to the Chinese development bank and export and import bank of China. And this therefore, this bank therefore is able to give very cheap loans to the African countries and the underdeveloped countries. Therefore, it is able to outbid. Similarly, let me tell you another thing that China does. China puts very less or negligible export duty on its products. Therefore, these products remain cheap. So whenever these uh, Chinese products, they come to any country, people find them cheaper than the, uh, than the indigenous products. Therefore, 
this is kind of a discriminatory taxation now lot of countries are doing these things they are kind of uh, um, making things easy for their industries but if you see the global perspective the global scenario they are not doing any favor whatsoever to the trade and commerce the global trade and commerce another thing that is happening is that another thing so in one word if i can say uh, the nationalized tax systems inadequately affect or adversely affect the global capital movement and affect the interest rates now another thing that is happening is that the big companies you know there is a disproportionate tax structure all the countries don't have the same tax structure no like for example i i give i'll give you an example of football a football player is good football player is more likely to play in spain than in english premier league although english premier league is very popular because in uk he has to pay more taxes in spain he has to pay less taxes so more earnings so therefore these things are not good for trade disproportionate tax structure what because of this what happens is that some bigger companies they are favored they get a leverage advantage to invest in the transnational market or abroad markets therefore there is rapid oligopolization of the market structures across various sector for example look at india retail sector telecom sector there is oligopolization what is the meaning of oligopoly it means there are very few sellers and there are huge buyers so take a look at example of telecom sector in india how many sellers are there you can count on your fingertips there is bharti airtel there is vodafone there is jio this that and i mean there are hardly any but if you take a look at the number of buyer there are 80 crore mobile phones in india there are more than 100 crore mobile services in india so i mean uh, there you know everywhere it is happening there is a consolidation of the economies consolidation of the companies in a particular sector which causes causes oligopolization now please also note that uh, these things were not talked about much now let me give you another example of this oligopolization what is the demerit of it so demerit is that in a oligopolistic market the sector can fail at any time because there will be few players and anything goes wrong then the things will go haywire now telecom sector in india it is under immense pressure right now because almost every company right now is struggling because of heavy debt that they owe to the banks so what happens is whenever there is a boom and you know that in india uh, the telecom sector showed a great boom now we have more than 80 crore mobile connection therefore banks gave easy loans to the telecom sector much more than the their capacity to repay because they thought that okay right now the industrial level this uh, telecom revolution is going on and therefore these company will grow and they will pay back no problem so they will not in, in the short term but they will earn in the long term then they will be able to do the debt servicing which means they will be able to earn from the loans that we give that is called debt servicing and then they will be able to pay our principal along with the interest and we will earn big now what has happened is uh the all the companies bharti airtel vodafone they took huge loans from indian banks and then they spread their services they made connections phone calls available at a cheap very cheap price therefore everybody subscribed to their services now the market is dominated by bharti airtel vodafone jio and all these now as soon as bharti airtel and vodafone they thought that this is the time to earn money came jio and jio caused disruptive revolution because of price so that is the problem now the telecom sector is feeling the heat and the companies will not survive unless they are bailed out but government will bail them out with the public money that is the tax payers money and therefore this is our revenue transfer only our money is going in the banks of vodafone and airtel so and when there is a talk about waiving of the loans of the farmer then the government is up in arms saying that it will put a load on the exchequer but what about the industries so there is a discrimination between how the government sees the farmers and how the government government sees the industries another thing that was not talked about was the, about the banking see banks their assets are going down in every country almost because of regulatory uh, you know increased global regulatory environment post 2008 see in 2008 there was a financial crisis right there was a recession there was a uh, stagflation in some countries after 2008 the countries adopted new checks and balances which were much more stringent much more strict and therefore the banks they were not allowed to do whatever they want and therefore banks they had to face huge regulatory frameworks they have to be uh, compliant to lot of rules therefore the lending capacity of the banks decreased and now the banks are facing the heat because of the twin balance sheet problem that is the banks are giving loan to someone let that someone be abc now that loan this person abc has to earn some profit from this loan only then he will be able to pay back the loan with interest and this abc is not able to earn it is it goes in loss 
so that is it is not able to do debt servicing so it is not able to pay back to the bank therefore banks are struggling with non performing asset because of non performing asset the bank's assets are going down when banks assets go down banks uh, their revenue will go down because there will be less capital in the bank for it to lend to others and therefore this is called a twin balance sheet problem what is twin balance sheet problem the going down of the assets of the banks therefore the banks need to be recapitalized about these there was very less discussion in the g20 you know how our uh, banking is dying almost in every country it is suffering so banks have become restricted in their lending capacity particularly in areas of equity investment which involves some risk this has negatively affected the domestic investment needs from various banking channel for especially for small and medium scale enterprises because banks have always been hesitant to give loans to the small and medium scale enterprises now you will tell me but in india banks do give they give because it comes under priority sector lending so banks are given a mandate that for agriculture for uh, you know small and medium enterprises and you have to give priority to these and therefore there is a fixed ratio that uh, of your uh, you know uh, net value added that you have to give to the come to priority sector that is why they give otherwise they are always in favor of giving to the bigger companies because that that almost gives them the surety of fixed returns of of at least short returns now in basel 3 uh, see the thing is it's uh, you know that india is basel 3 compliant right basel 3 was Uh, regarding the capital adequacy ratio norms so let me give an example there is a bank now bank gives some loan let's say 100 crore rupees to some person abc and this person is not able to earn profit from this 100 crore his company goes in loss that is it is not able to do debt servicing therefore it will not be able to pay the principal with interest to the bank and basically it will, he will not be able to pay the principal also not be able to return the loan so first it will become bad loan then it will become after 90 days a non performing asset so the bank will be like okay i am not getting this 100 crore back now this money will sink and therefore bank will go to asset reconstruction company asset reconstruction company will buy the debt from the bank it will pay 50 crore rupees to the bank and it bank will say okay i was not able to get uh, even a single money out of it at least i am getting 50 crore so arc asset reconstruction company will buy the 100 crore of the bank in 50 crore making a profit of 50 crore but the problem is now the uh, the responsibility of taking back the money from abc is asset reconstruction companies and not the banks and we have seen that a lot of times in fact most of the time asset reconstruction companies are also not able to take the money back from the uh, from the person who has taken the loan and therefore asset reconstruction companies are also in loss and uh, they give various options like one time settlement so they will say to this chap you can pay 60 crore rupees okay you will still make a profit of 40 crore and we will make a profit of 10 crore i mean they envisage that they will make a profit of 10 crore so what is happening because of asset reconstruction company the bad loans of the bank so they are being transferred to asset reconstruction company that is what the government is doing to show that the bad the banks have less bad loans because the banks have to be basel 3 compliant they have to maintain capital adequacy ratio so in other words it is calling up it is like a bluff okay it is it is like a bluff asset reconstruction company because the banks will show that these come under nbfc non banking financial company and basel 3 is not for nbfc it is only for banking companies so that is one way to reduce the bad loans of the bank now i'll tell you another reason about the capital adequacy see why do you feel secure when you put money in the bank what is the thing why what what is the security in a bank so the banks have to maintain 4% of the cash with reserve bank of india which is called cash reserve ratio the banks also have to invest 20% of their wealth which keeps on changing from time to time that is the statutory liquidity ratio in the government securities it can be bond it can be government schemes it can be government psus it can be anything it has to be invested in a government setup so 20% is slr 4% is crr okay now but one th you thing you must understand is that this is also the the money of the people this 24% is also money of the people only no so what basel 3 says is that bank should have some of its own money also so right now they are saying that 12.5% which is the capital adequacy ratio it has to be bank's own money so we are basel 3 compliant we have to follow basel 3 norms remember that and as i already told you non performing assets see non performing assets now they are like shooting up of all the banks put together that is public sector banks and private sector banks together have a non performing asset of 9% if you talk about only the government bank public sector banks their non performing assets have increased up to 12.1% so reserve bank of india this year has taken the prompt corrective action against six banks prompt corrective action is that it will not allow the banks to uh, 
mushroom it will not allow new branches of the banks it will also uh, not allow banks to share the dividend profit it will also not allow the banks to it will cut the salary of the managing director and when these are some steps which the reserve bank of india takes it also freezes or reduces the lending capacity of the bank so also deposit capacity of the bank so these are some of the steps that reserve bank of india is taking it is going hard on the banks which are already reeling under pressure and the twin balance sheet problem is there that is the companies that take they take loan they, they come under debt they are not able to do debt servicing debt keeps on accumulating and therefore they are not able to pay interest payments on the loans and please note 40% of the corporate debt is owed by companies who are not earning enough to pay back their interest payments and most of these are infrastructure companies so in technical terms this means that they have an interest coverage ratio less than 1% now let's talk about some other news so you know about the udan scheme no ude desh ka aam nagrik which means let every common person of the country fly now fly does not mean fly with wings fly means take a let him take a flight so first edition of wings 2017 it means sab ude sab jude which in english means let everyone fly in a in a uh, in a flight and let everyone connect with each other so this is what you call rcs regional connectivity scheme and first edition of wings took place in new delhi and our minister for civil aviation is ashok gajpati raju and our minister for civil aviation minister of state for civil aviation is shri jayant sinha and it, the event was event got the participation of 28 states and 19 uh, union and union territories and out of these 19 states i mean uh, they a lot of states they presented their their regional connectivity scheme plans and everything you don't need to go too much into this but i'll tell you some very crucial facts about the civil aviation sector in india first let me complete the the base the basic hygiene so during the wings 2017 interactive sessions were conducted between the airline companies tour operators airport operator cargo operator aircraft manufacturer so all the stakeholders in the civil aviation sector they were brought on board so that there can be a common framework or synergy established between all the important stakeholders for the maximizing the benefit now the government has said that we want to make the airline sector lucrative how it is making the air, airline sector lucrative it has taken a lot of decision first is underwriting of seats see the government wants to connect the remote areas also with with the flight right but will the companies find it attractive or will the will the companies want to increase their planes from delhi to mumbai you see if the government tells me that uh, i am i am indigo okay i am indigo airlines so the government asks me to start a flight from delhi to let's say shimla so from delhi to shimla the distance is not much no and for this distance when i can pay 600 rupees for a bus why would i pay thousands of rupees for a flight ticket also how many people will travel from delhi to shimla you know i will have to buy one plane extra from delhi to shimla not one but many if i plan to have many flights then flight occupancy will be less number of seats will be some will be vacant also for example i recently went went from delhi to dharamshala and 50 to 60% of the flight was vacant now is it cost effective for the companies is it attractive for the companies it was a small plane because long plane cannot be there because of uh, the size of the uh, you know runway is very very short in the hilly areas so you can't have a big plane there so therefore government says we will do underwriting what is underwriting it is like an insurance so for example let's say the government tells me have a flight from delhi to shimla because i want to connect delhi and shimla it is a regional connectivity scheme udan so i will tell the government well only if 20% people they are flying but the break even point is 30% so if 30% people fly i will be at a break even price okay if 20% less than 30% occupancy is there i will go into loss so the government will tell me that okay this 10% i will pay okay that is i will do a insurance you will not suffer any loss okay so this guaranteeing of payment in case of loss or damage is called underwriting so the government is willing to do underwriting of seats now second most important problem atf what is atf it is the fuel that we use in the flight so let's say you have taken this flight what happens sometimes is that the flight it is not able to land at the right time because of air traffic and because of some military rules sometimes so what happens usually is that the plane the flight it keeps on it keeps on uh, you know waving in the air and therefore because of that the fuel expense increases because of the increase of fuel expense the cost effectiveness decreases and as such the fuel is very very costly so the government said we will reduce the tax on the atf that is the 
एविएशन टर्बाइन फ्यूल अनदर थिंग इज नाइट पार्किंग कंसेशनल इलेक्ट्रिसिटी वी विल गिव इलेक्ट्रिसिटी फॉर चीप वाटर चार्जेस शुड बी चीप इलेक्ट इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर सपोर्ट वी आर प्रोवाइडिंग रूट्स एंड एयरपोर्ट वाइज बेनिफिट वी विल प्रोवाइड टू द एयरलाइन ऑपरेटर्स सो दैट टू द एयरलाइन कंपनीज लाइक इंडिगो टू मेक इट ल्यूक्रेटिव बिजनेस now let me tell you some uh, very important facts why the government is doing this why it is saying that i want to connect even the remotest of areas with aviation india is one of the fastest growing aviation markets and currently it is the ninth largest civil aviation market in the world it is projected to be the third largest aviation market by 2020 there are 33 unserved airports see there are two types of airports one is the underserved airports and one is the unserved unserved means no flight goes there underserved means only one flight goes there okay and we want to make use of these airports we want to increase the number of flights so 33 unserved airports are being added for scheduled flights in one year as compared to 75 operational airports during last 70 years so basic basically they were hitting the congress government they were saying that look in last 70 years only 75 operational airports and in just one year we have 33 unserved airports that are being uh, added for the scheduled flights and airport uh, airport authority of india has plans to revive and operationalize around 50 airports in the next 2 years to improve regional and remote air connectivity and it needs the support of states also so kerala said that we will reduce vat from 4% to 1% on fuel that is aviation turbine fuel andhra said the same haryana said the same punjab also committed meghalaya also committed so under udan scheme ude desh ka aam nagrik let the common man fly this scheme the vat will be reduced on atf to from 4% to 1% now in udan scheme see india is growing okay now to sit in a flight is no more uh, you know will no more guarantee you respect and prestige but in earlier days it was a thing of prestige that okay i took a flight from delhi to shimla now it is no more like that even a common man is flying now but the problem is the market is not growing at a rate at which we want for example the per capita it is only 0.1 trip that is on an average one indian in one year travels by flight 0.1 times in china it is 3 times 0.3 but by 2035 45 crore people in india would have used would have taken flight that that these are data from the ministry and by 2030 46% of the people who fly they will be from small towns tier 2 and tier 3 towns and these town people they won't be able to afford very costly tickets also there are restriction now let me give an example from delhi to shimla see delhi to shimla because of short runway length on hilly area height and temperature restrictions the aircraft will not be able to fly the total capacity of 48 passengers let's say it's a 48 passenger plane so in delhi shimla lag the flight will carry 35 passengers and on, on return only 15 passengers will be able to fly so the company will make loss and that loss will be compensated by the government that is called viability gap funding viability gap funding and viability gap funding will be used to bridge the gap between the cost of airline operations and expected revenue let's say the company is expecting x revenue and the cost is more you know so it is y so y minus x will be provided by the government under udan scheme the first flight was in fact from shimla to delhi only at a price of 2036 rupees please note that if the flight journey is less than 1 hour or a 500 km up to 500 km then you cannot charge more than 2500 rupees for at least 50% of the sitting capacity this is as per udan scheme so udan scheme is expected to act as a catalyst for the growth of the indian aviation sector and 33 destinations across the country will come under udan scheme by 2017 end please also note you must have noticed have you taken a flight you must have noticed you can't use wifi inside the flight but does it happen everywhere no in fact in very few countries india north korea they don't provide wifi services inside the flight and why they don't because it's a security issue our security does not allow indian air force does not allow so for uh, and also uh, you know the airport operators airport operators means what let's say indira gandhi international airport so indira gandhi international airport is it profitable out of 115 airports in india only 15 are profitable 100 are making heavy losses and they are bound to go bankrupt in the days to come so that is why we need to take concrete steps what are those concrete steps we need to take one we are already taking udan scheme we are we have uh, started then also wifi we are not giving please also note that if any international airline it occupies india's flying space it flies over india it has to switch off the wifi when it travels above india 
that is as per the rules because securities agencies in india are not convinced and i'll tell you why because let's say we allow wi-fi inside the plane so everybody will use wi-fi it's a free wi-fi no everybody will, will use it now even if it is not free if people use wi-fi then it creates security problem and for security expenditure of airport operators is it is the heaviest expenditure now let me give an example how airports are protected by the central industrial security force cisf and the cost is one lakh per month per person per month per person that is how much they have to spend on cisf constables and because of the security cost so if people start using wi-fi the security cost will further increase thereby causing the airport operators to go bankrupt and as i said only 15 out of 115 airports in india they are making any profit if at all now next news is that gst which is the 122nd amendment bill and 101st amendment act it was joined by jammu and kashmir also so it's our privilege jammu and kashmir now finally we can say it is one nation one tax i mean what after all what is india without the crown of india jammu and kashmir so one nation one tax and for that president of india promulgated two ordinances okay now ordinances are passed when the house is not in session so these these are central goods and services tax extension to jammu kashmir ordinance 2017 and integrated goods and services tax extension to jammu and kashmir ordinance 2017 these two were promulgated by the president of india and now gst has been applied in jammu and kashmir it took effect on 8th of july 2017 now let's talk about gst uh, one more thing so everybody is struggling with gst right now right we don't have information we don't know what are the new prices so the central board of excise and custom that is cbec please not cbec earlier was called cbic in fact just one month back it was called cbic they changed the name from central board of indirect taxes and customs to central board of excise and customs so therefore they have launched a mobile app on android very soon it will be available on mac that is ios that is called gst rates finder and on gst rate finder you can check the rate of anything you will be provided with all the information you can get about you can know about the commodities the prices you can even work this app in the offline mode now let me talk about the world food india so i told you that the prime minister of italy paolo gentiloni was invited by prime minister narendra modi on the sidelines of the g20 summit for world food india program world food india 2017 so harsimrat kaur badal from the shiromani akali dal party who is a part of nda she is wife of prakash she is wife of sukhbir badal who is the son of prakash singh badal the ex chief minister of punjab so harsimrat kaur badal at she ad, addressed the industries and business leaders from punjab and haryana in chandigarh so haryana will be the partner state for world food india and not only haryana andhra pradesh will also be the partner state for world food india and what is the what is this world food india about so all the stakeholders that is the food processors food companies and various organization they will all meet so it will be a connect of india to the world and there was awareness there was a chandigarh road show that was organized in the union territory of chandigarh capital of punjab haryana to seek the active participation at the world food india 2017 and also share the details of the kisan sampada scheme that has been started she said that there is a huge scope in the food processing sector and 42 mega food parks will be there in india which will benefit 5 lakh people which will provide direct employment to 5 lakh people and benefit 25 lakh farmers so these food parks and sampada scheme the aim is to double the farmers income by 2022 the sampada scheme being implemented now promises to benefit from the small farmers to an affluent one so basically they want to increase the disposable income of the farmers and food sector in india is scheduled to expand it is touted to expand three times by 2020 and the world is looking towards india and through a platform like world food india at all the international markets can be attracted to india so it is by the ministry of food processing industry it is organizing it in association with cii which is the confederation of indian industry this will be in new delhi from 3rd to 5th of november 2017 so as i said it is a platform for showcasing india's strength india's food processing strength and lot of investors manufacturers producers policy makers they will all participate in this please note italy has accepted to be the focus country and haryana and andhra pradesh will be the partner states of world food india program now let's talk about minorities the jains muslims etc so mukhtar abbas naqvi is our minister of state for minority affairs and uh, he said the he inaugurated the first garib nawaz skill development center in capital of telangana hyderabad first garib nawaz skill development center total 100 districts uh, in 100 district 100 garib nawaz skill development centers will be established in india and there is a education scheme also tahri ke taleem 
تعلیم means education so تحریک تعلیم will be launched on October 15 the birthday of APJ Abdul Kalam and 100 Navode Vidyale type schools will be opened for minorities and 23 have already been opened these are the Gurukul type residential schools just like a boarding school and the ministry said five world class educational institutions will be built will be established for providing modern education to minorities they will also focus on the traditional Indian system of medicine like Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha, Homeopathy etc. CM of Uttarakhand, Trivendra Singh Rawat, he is the new CM of Bharatiya Janata Party in Uttarakhand, there was Harish Rawat of the Congress Party and our Minister of State for PMO, for space, for I mean, pension, for personnel, Dr. Jitendra Singh, they said something about good governance in Nainital which is in Uttarakhand. So there was a regional conference, 26th such conference on the theme good governance and replication of best practices. So what is this? What is this about? Good governance. See, they are lecturing on good governance and they have also 25th December, it's a it's a Christmas day, right? But it is also the good governance day because it is the birthday of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the former Prime Minister of India. So Dr. Jitender Singh said that, uh, you know, Jandan accounts were opened. Basically, he was focusing on the initiatives of the government. That self-attestation, you don't need a gazette officer to attest your document. Scrapping of interviews for non-gazetted post. For non-gazetted post, you don't need to give interviews now. And introduction of skill test. They are path-breaking initiatives for good governance and citizen centricity. 65% population of India is below 40 years of age. And uh, there is also setting up of capital venture fund, which means that if any youth wants to establish a entrepreneurship uh, venture, new business, he get, they'll get funds from the startup, these funds, venture funds. He also said that there was a CP Grams portal that was started by the government that is the centralized public grievances redressal and monitoring system that is called CP Gram. Through this 80 to 90 percent of the grievances they have been addressed. Now let's talk about Ujala. What is Ujala? Ujala means uh, Ujala means uh, brightness in uh, in English. Ujala. So the full form is Unnat Jeevan. Unnat Jeevan means uh, Unnat means progress, progressive life, okay? Unnat Jeevan by affordable LEDs and appliances for all scheme. Now, under this scheme, the prices of the LED bulbs and other equipments have been revised. You don't need to know the new prices, but just know that consumers, they had appealed to the government not to increase the prices and the prices that were fixed by Energy Efficiency Services Limited to keep the prices same, that was what consumers were appealing. And Energy Efficiency Services Limited works under the administration of Ministry of Power, headed by Piyush Goyal. Now, Ujala scheme was launched by the government on January the 5th, 2015 and the aim was we will replace 77 crore, 770 million uh, inefficient bulbs because they consume more power with energy efficient light emitting diode bulbs because they consume less power and now they have already replaced just less than 25 crore bulbs. So you can say almost one third the target is over. And they have also replaced 27.6 lakh, not crore, lakh tube lights, some tube lights and some fans, that you can say. And this has saved total how much energy? 3,244 crore kilowatt hour. This is the annual energy saving. And also it has resulted in the avoidance of over 6,525 megawatt of peak demand. Also it has decreased the bill of consumers in India by 12,963 crores and it has also helped in the reduction of carbon dioxide emission by 2.62 crore tons less carbon dioxide this year. Now petroleum minister and this is my main cover story for today. Petrol, what happens to petrol? Why the petrol prices are decreasing and why consumers don't get the advantage of it? I will explain in detail. Petroleum minister is Dharmendra Pradhan from Odisha. And he will represent India at the 22nd World Petroleum Congress at Istanbul in Turkey. World Petroleum Congress is triannual that is happens once in three years. And our Minister of State will go there. Now, World Congress is like an Olympics of oil and gas industry. Because a lot of CEOs, policy makers, ministers, multinational companies like Rosneft and Gazprom and ONGC and everybody goes there. So he will also give ministerial session on this and plenary session on these topics that is not important but what is important is this petrol is outside gst everybody knows right petrol is outside gst and uh, the petroleum ministry it want petroleum industry the companies which deal in petroleum they want to come under gst to get the benefit of the input tax refund what is input tax refund for that watch my second june second july pib video you will understand what is input tax refund 
that is available under the GST. Because right now, input tax refund is only applicable to excise duty and not on any other duty. So also one more thing. Previously, what used to happen? The prices of petrol and diesel, they used to be revised in a fortnight every 15 days. Now they are being revised real time every day at 6 a.m. Earlier, one difference was that the prices were revised they were applicable at 12 midnight. They were effective from 12 midnight, the revised prices. Now they are effective from 6 a.m. in the morning and they are revised every day. So the government wanted to do a pilot testing. It did it in five places. That is Udaipur, Jamshedpur, Vishakhapatnam, Chandigarh and Puducherry from May the 1st. And it said that the pilot testing was successful. They have implemented it across country from 15th of June. Now the petrol pump owners are on strike. What is government saying? Government is saying if we change the petrol of if we change the petrol price every day, then the benefit of the decrease in the price goes to consumer every day. That is, there is a real time, uh, you know, real time estimation of prices and the benefit goes to the consumer, the end user. But this is a bluff, and I'll tell you why. See, all the petrol pump business, petrol pump owners right now, they are making heavy losses because of this daily daily revision in the fuel prices that was implemented from June the 15th. Now what is the petroleum ministry saying? It is telling the oil companies that you give more dealers commission to the petrol pump owner so that this loss can be made up for. But is it a good practice? Will you tell, will you get your act together or will you tell the oil companies to give more dealer commission to assuage the situation? Now first I'll tell you while the oil prices have been de declining in the last three to four years consistently. See during the time of Manmohan Singh, it was around $160 per barrel. It came to $140, $120, $100. Now, last to last week, government has bought uh, one barrel. One barrel means 159 liter for $46.72. Oil prices have reduced more than 75%. But has the petrol been uh, cheaper? In 2014, when the prices were more than $140 per barrel, I was paying in Delhi 65 rupees, 67 some rupees for petrol. Today in 2017, three years later, I am paying 65. I mean, there is no difference. If at all there is one, there is no difference. Only three to four percent less. But the prices have reduced by 75 percent. Why I am not getting the benefit? That I'll explain to you. First, let me tell you why the oil prices are decreasing internationally. First, the role of Saudi Arabia. See, who exports oil? OPEC, Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, a cartel. Cartel means what? I mean, they are oligopoly, just like oligopoly. Very few countries that export oil. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Angola, and Venezuela, and all these countries. Now, please note, Saudi Arabia is a rich country, right? But not everybody is rich. Venezuela, Angola. See, these countries, their entire economy depends on the petrol. Venezuela, 65% of economy depends on petrol. If something happens to petrol, then the economy collapses. That's what has happened in Venezuela. Economy has collapsed. Now, there are riots going on in Venezuela, everywhere. So, role of Saudi Arabia is there that Saudi Arabia went for a price war. Saudi Arabia knows that it is a rich country, but others are not rich. So if it goes for a price war, it has deep pockets. It can take the pain for some years, but these countries will collapse. And then when these companies collapse, the entire market will be of Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is also a wicked, wicked country. Now, another important factor for decline of oil practice. See, supply and demand is a universal, universal thing, right? In economics, supply is huge of petrol. Every country is producing and producing petrol. There is no, there is capacity building. The capacity building has increased. They are exploring oil from the remotest of places. Advances in technology, lot of supply, but demand has not increased. Earlier it was said that the number of cars are increasing. The countries are becoming, I mean, the especially developing countries, they need oil. It hasn't happened. So there is the demand from India, China, Japan. These are the countries which import oil, right? Mainly the demand. Turkey also imports lot of oil, but demand is static it has not increased significantly and from europe the demand has rather declined why because now people are using alternate sources of energy also solar energy nuclear energy and electricity and also another reason is that people are not using cars and all in developed countries they are using the public transport so the demand did not increase as what was thought earlier on and therefore countries they started increasing production of petrol thinking that the demand will keep on increasing and increasing and increasing it hasn't happened now the demand is not there and supply is huge so the prices have crashed one more factor iran america uplifted the economic sanctions which had it had put on iran so iran it is now supplying oil also again so supply iran supply also added to this supply again more supply 
America it has it is exploring shale oil which is very similar to the gasoline similar to petrol again supply becomes more because of this because America it is using its own oil now America was a big importer of oil so far now it has its own oil while it will import demand again decreased demand decreased from Europe demand did not increase from the countries as you were thinking so petrol prices crashed now why we don't get the benefit I'll tell you from this this is very very latest this is 16 June government has bought petrol from other countries 47 dollar for one barrel one barrel is what it is 159 liter this is petrol price this is diesel price so government is buying 150 liter pet 59 liter petrol at 3050 rupees so what will be the price of one liter of petrol divide unitary method okay 19.18 liter now let's say okay they apply some taxes we should get a 25 no we are getting at what 65 why I am not able to buy the petrol at 25 when the government is buying the petrol at 19 rupees is because government puts two very very big duties to make money first is the VAT and more important is the excise duty so you can see here it has put 21.48 excise duty on petrol so you add 21 rupees this becomes 40 then you put 13.92 which is almost 14 rupees you put 14 more that is the VAT 54 rupees I mean and some other taxes and all so finally I get for how much 65 rupees you can see same happens with diesel also I should be getting diesel at 19.18 for how much I am getting 54.49 because why because again VAT and excise duty now you will ask me one thing in Manmohan Singh's days in the Congress days also I was getting petrol at around 65 67 rupees like Today also I am getting 65. Now the prices have reduced. That time it was $140 per barrel. Today it is only $47 per barrel. So does that mean that that time there was no excise duty and VAT? It's true. That time the excise duty and VAT was very very low. We were importing. The importing price was not 19 but it was somewhere around 35, 36, somewhere around 50, sometimes 40. So the government it has put on this duty to make money. I am not saying the government is wrong but the government uh, I will tell you what the government says about this. Okay, now what they have done is they have increased the VAT and uh, excise duty to such huge extent, so such huge extent that the price remains the same. We are getting it for same. What the what is the government's argument? Government says this extra money that we'll make in between that we don't pass this benefit to the consumer. We are using this money to build infrastructure, roads, bridges, infrastructure. Okay, that money saved is used in building infrastructure. Very convenient argument. Arun Jaitley said that we are funding social security schemes, Atal Pension Yojana, Atal Pension Scheme, Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bima Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bima Yojana, a lot of social security schemes are there in India. They are funded by this money that is saved from the petrol. Government also says that we want to reduce the consumption of petrol. If we supply petrol for 25 rupees, everybody will start wasting petrol, start using petrol more than its requirement. So that will cause environmental problems, pollution. And India already is the fourth biggest polluter in the world. Also, government says that if the petrol consumption increases significantly, we have to buy more oil from European countries, from Middle East countries that will that will keep us in a negative balance of trade. And we already have a negative balance of trade which will get even more negative because of our heavy oil imports. That is the government's, uh, that government's argument. So therefore, what will happen now if the oil prices increase? Will the government be able to finance these schemes? Will the government be able to build infrastructure? Yes. But what they will have to do is, they will have to increase the price of petrol. So people will feel cheated. When you decrease, you don't pass us the benefit. When you increase, you increase the petrol prices. That is what happens every time because government otherwise will not be able to fund these schemes. In fact, experts say that at least 1% of India's GDP growth is extra this, these days. We are growing at around 7, no? It would have been 6 had the oil prices not collapsed. So this is one thing that has gone in government's favor. If the oil prices increase, they will have to decrease the VAT or excise duty either, but that will re result in less revenue. So what they will do, they will increase the price. So this was the explanation for all the topics of uh, today. I hope you are enjoying my coverage. Thank you and please share.